Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Greetings and welcome to another episode of Canadian History X. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can. Just go to patreon.com slash Canada EHX. You can support the podcast for $3 a month. You can also donate to the podcast by going to CanadaEHX.com and clicking Donate. I do this full-time, and every dollar you give helps keep the podcasts going. And don't forget, I have two other podcasts you can enjoy, Pucks and Cups and From John to Justin, available on all podcast platforms. During the first half of the 20th century, one of the most feared diseases for parents was polio. While polio would strike anyone at any age, it was the children under the age of five who were most at risk. From 1910 to 1955, polio upended lives and changed Canada in many ways. Today, I look at that period of time when polio was a mysterious and sometimes deadly disease in our country. A brief description of polio before we get down to its history worldwide and in Canada. Polio is caused by the polio virus, and typically most people recover from it fully. Unfortunately, in 0.5% of the cases, the virus moves from the gut to attack the ventral nervous system and cause muscle weakness. This can happen within hours. Typically, muscle weakness occurs in the legs, and of those infected, 70% have no symptoms, 25% have minor symptoms, and 5% have a headache or neck stiffness. Roughly 2-5% to of children die, while 15-30% to of adults die if the virus moves to the central nervous system. It is typically spread through the infected fecal matter entering the mouth, but can also spread by food or water that has been contaminated by human feces. Polio has existed for centuries, with ancient Egyptian paintings and carvings showing healthy people with withered limbs and children using canes. It is believed that the Roman Emperor Claudius had it as a child, resulting in a limp for the rest of his life. Until the 20th century, major polio epidemics were actually quite unknown. Localized polio epidemics began to appear in the 19th century with reports of multiple polio cases in a localized area first appearing in 1841 in Louisiana. It would be another 50 years before another cluster would occur. By the 20th century though, cases were increasing quickly. In 1907, 2,500 cases were reported in New York City, and by 1916, 27,000 cases were reported, with 2,000 deaths in New York City. Today, the disease is completely preventable through the polio vaccine, but I will get to that later. Throughout this episode, I will relate some of the stories of regular Canadians who dealt with polio as well. In Canada, the first known outbreak occurred in 1910 when a little girl was taken to a Hamilton hospital with the belief that she had rabies. In fact, it was polio, but that was only discovered after she had sadly passed away. This would be the beginning of the polio epidemics in Canada. From here, the polio epidemics would become larger, more severe, and impact older children and youth. It would also hit adults, including future President of the United States, Franklin Delano Roosevelt who contracted it while vacationing off the coast of New Brunswick. Good evening. I'd like to present you with some facts. First, my name is John Fisher. Secondly, the place is Montreal. Thirdly, the subject. The subject is one of the best friends we've ever had. That friend's asleep now, and he'll never wake up. And tomorrow at this time, he'll rest beneath the soil he loved. The soil of America. Underneath the oaks and the quiet. Beside the rolling Hudson. He was a man, that's why he liked to slip back to the farm at Hyde Park. He had his preferences, though, but really he loved everything that was clean and fresh and good. He loved our country, Canada, and he came here often. No, not just as president. He was a tiny boy when he first looked out over that high cliff and down at the tides of Passamaquoddy in New Brunswick, the island of Campobello, an island given by the British to one of their military heroes, Captain Owen who lost an eye and an arm at Pondicherry in the East Indies. Naval men lived here, and then in 1890, they sold it to an American syndicate as a summer place. And one of the first Americans to build a summer home on that island was James Roosevelt. He brought his son Franklin there, and in the blue waters of Passamaquoddy, Quaddy, the president called it, he sailed the seas and roamed the capes and grew strong. He knew the sardine men, he gathered dulse off the shore. 
He talked to the village folk. He learned to love the sea and watch the seagulls and the little ox and the sea parrots, the clowns of the bird life who live in this sweet corner of New Brunswick. The tides, the long mud flats, the eddies, the smells, they filled him with a yearning. And he came back each summer, every summer. Then one day, history. Yes, history struck. And when the village doctor looked at him in the big brown bungalow above the cliff, he was writhing in pain. Polio had hit him. Infantile paralysis in Canada. Hospitals were far away. Then started a great family struggle. The United States, his country, and over which he later became president, refused to admit him because of his sickness. Franklin Roosevelt almost died in Canada while his family waited and pulled all the strings. Finally, the United States medical authorities gave in. And as an act of mercy, he was rushed to New York in the nick of time. No one at the time understood what was causing polio or how it spread. Provincial health departments would close schools, restrict children from traveling or attending the movies, while also quarantining the sick. As time went on, it became clear that this did not help stop the spread of polio. In 1912, Lewis Thompson came to Freud, Saskatchewan with his father after becoming a victim of polio. And while he survived the disease, it left him with a foot that turned outwards and was mostly useless. In the 1920s, Peter Friesen of Rosthern, Saskatchewan, who was a local teacher, became ill with polio, and he lost the use of the muscles in one leg. He bought an electric shock apparatus and exercised constantly to overcome the loss of that muscle. The leg was left thin and shorter than the other, but Peter was happy that he was able to walk once again. Polio epidemics would strike in British Columbia and Alberta in 1927, Manitoba in 1928, Ontario in 1929 and 1930, and Quebec in 1931 and 1932. In the Manitoba 1928 epidemic, there were 434 cases and 37 deaths. The epidemics then hit again, larger this time, reaching Manitoba again in 1936 and Ontario in 1937. After Manitoba was hit again, the province took a stronger approach to polio. An epidemiologist was appointed to work in the hardest hit areas and he was given the power to insist on a rigid observation of quarantine regulations while also acting as a diagnostic consultant. Glenn Strong of Rossburn, Manitoba contracted polio at the age of 15 in 1935. He would go through two operations to improve the strength in his legs at the Children's Hospital in Winnipeg. Unfortunately, the operations were not successful, but Glenn was still able to walk around, but if he fell, he needed to crawl on his hands and knees until he could get to something that he could pull himself up on. Manitoba was especially hit hard by polio, with epidemics hitting in 1928, 1936, 1941, 1947, and 1952. In the 1941 epidemic, 969 people were impacted. In Ontario in 1937, the Ontario Society for Crippled Children predicted a significant outbreak that year, and they devoted the June issue of their magazine to articles on polio. They were able to predict the disease moving to Ontario because of the trend of polio to move from west to east in the country over the years. It is estimated that by 1934, half the disabled population of Canada had their disabilities traced to polio. In 1930, Canada would begin using its first iron lung, which was brought from Boston to Toronto and installed at the Hospital for Sick Children. These devices were huge metal cylinders that would regulate the breathing of people whose polio had caused issues with their ability to breathe. While the hospital waited for its first iron lung to arrive, a wooden iron lung was built with materials on hand. John Gordon, a three-year-old, was the first child to use it and he thankfully stabilized. His mother would do an interview with the Toronto Star begging the wealthy to donate money so hospitals could build more lumber lungs to save lives. The one iron lung that arrived in 1930 would remain the only one in Canada for the next seven years. In 1937, a severe outbreak pushed the Ontario government to get more iron lungs with 27 bought and built in only six weeks. Each of those lungs was bought by the province at a cost of $650 to $700. In that epidemic year, 63 polio cases were treated in iron lungs with 40 of the children not surviving, 12 recovering, and 11 remaining in respirators by March 1938. 
During the outbreak, the Ontario Ministry of Health published a large ad describing the signs and symptoms of polio, which were of little help, and they suggested parents keep their children in their own yard. Amidst the pandemic, the Ministry of Health spokesman Gordon Jackson stated that he felt there would be no great outbreak of polio, and he suggested that the new nasal spray convalescent serum be used whenever possible, despite no proof of its value. He would say, quote, It can do no harm. That nasal spray was designed to block the polio virus from entering the body. It was used on 5,000 Toronto children, but after two rounds of treatment it was abandoned as it did not prevent polio and instead caused children to lose their sense of smell. Even with the vaccine doing nothing to help, many parents demanded sprays from their doctors and some even tried to make them on their own. In 1937, Canada saw 4,000 cases of the polio virus, including 2,500 in Ontario. Numerous schools were shut down amid a public health panic in the province. One child who was hit with polio during the epidemic was Gordon Jackson. Only four years old, the disease paralyzed his limbs and resulted in difficulty breathing. There was only one iron lung at the hospital at the time, so he had to wait a few weeks for another to arrive. His breathing was getting worse and an experimental respirator designed for infants was used after a carpenter built a larger wooden cabinet for him in five hours. Almost blue from the lack of oxygen, within two hours of using the wooden lung his breathing improved. Eventually, he had a portable respiratory jacket. Nine months later, he was free of any devices to help him breathe, but he was still in the hospital. R.H. Saunders, a city alderman with the Toronto City Hall, was the only member of the Board of Health to propose that the Canadian National Exhibition cancel its upcoming Children's Day. Mayor William Robbins responded with, quote, Do you want to kill the exhibition? Saunders responded, quote, Of course I don't want to kill the exhibition, but I don't want to kill children. In the end, Children's Day continued on, but the baby contest was cancelled. Many felt this was odd because the municipal government had been closing pools, public parks, schools, theatres and churches to children, but there seemed to be no problem with 200,000 children mingling freely on Children's Day. The Canadian National Exhibition was also expected to be large, with 1937 being the coronation year of King George VI. That day, Children's Day saw a 78,000 decrease in the number of children attending, but there still were those 200,000 people there for that day. To deal with the pandemic, the Ontario government spent $197,000 in 1937, and this was a huge jump from the $4,000 it had spent on average to deal with polio prior to that year. In 1939, the Manitoba Medical Association Review stated, quote, There is no disease over which the public is more apprehensive and in which both the laity and the medical profession feel so helpless than the epidemic of polio. During this period of time, running from the 1920s to the 1950s, no disease created such a strong response from Canadian governments than polio. In 1940, Sister Elizabeth Kenny would come to North America and make several trips into Canada to instruct nurses on her methods. Her methods to help treat polio included hot packs to relieve pain and passive movement of affected limbs. These methods were quickly adopted by most of the governments in Canada. In 1941, Manitoba and New Brunswick were both hit hard by another polio epidemic. In 1943, Clarence Shields' Muscana, Saskatchewan would be struck with polio and was taken to Saskatoon by ambulance. He would spend the next seven and a half months in hospital, including three weeks in isolation. In the local history of the community, visits to him are described as such, quote, to visit him, you had to stand on a box to reach a high window through which one tried to carry on a conversation. He was told that he would never walk again. For a time, he was very discouraged, but the desire to farm, coupled with a stubborn, courageous persistence, prompted him to try walking when he was alone. Eventually, Clarence won. The worst of the polio outbreaks would occur between 1949 and 1954 possibly as a result of the increased number of children in the generation called the Baby Boomers. In that period of time, 11,000 people in Canada were paralyzed by polio, and the Royal Canadian Air Force was used to deliver iron lungs throughout the country. Some notable Canadians would get polio during that period. Neil Young would contract polio in 1951 when he was five, 
and Joni Mitchell had contracted in 1952 when she was nine. In 2000, Joni Mitchell would describe the disease that hit her as a child, saying, quote, Polio is the disease that eats muscles. If it eats the muscles in your heart, it kills you. If it eats the muscles that control the flexing of your lungs, you end up in an iron lung. If it eats the muscle of your leg, it withers, or your arm, it withers. This is the season when polio is at its worst, and every precaution is being taken to stop the disease from spreading. In the Halifax area, for example, officials have postponed the opening of school as a safeguard. Here's Graham Allen with the details. The school ban is one of a series of developments which have come quickly in the last few days, as it became more and more apparent that this is the most serious polio situation we've had since 1942. City health authorities proclaimed orders barring children under 16 from schools, theaters, and churches. The town of Dartmouth, across the harbor from Halifax, adopted the same rules, and suburban communities are following suit. City playgrounds, which had closed for the season and put their equipment away, are now setting up again to give the children a place to play until the schools open. Other recent developments include the calling in of provincial health nurses from various parts of the province, the commandeering of iron lungs, the loan of nurses from the naval hospital to help out, and the construction of special hospital wards. On one of these jobs, a crew of electricians, plumbers, and carpenters worked all night to provide the facilities so urgently needed. City and provincial authorities are working closely in the situation and trying especially to muster sufficient nurses for many are needed, and the strain on those who have been working in the emergency is great. More than 150 cases of polio have been reported in the province, and more than half of these were discovered in the Halifax area. The last official figures listed seven deaths. Besides these cases, of course, many patients are ordered to hospital for observation if they have suspicious symptoms. Meanwhile, the aircraft carrier Magnificent, which sailed from Halifax recently, has reported seven cases at Malta, where she was to take part in joint fleet exercises. A special naval medical team has flown from Halifax to Malta to help the ship's medical staff. Several local events have been cancelled or postponed because of the situation, and there's some uneasiness among parents, many of those stricken being children. But though people are uneasy, there's no sign of panic. It's rather a realistic understanding that the situation is grave enough to justify special safeguards. This is Graham Allen reporting the news roundup from Halifax. The disease would peak in Canada in 1953 with 9,000 cases and 500 deaths. That made it the worst epidemic in Canada since the 1918 Spanish flu. During this peak, Manitoba had 72 iron lungs operating in one single Winnipeg hospital. In Edmonton during that epidemic, a thunderstorm knocked out power to the hospital and nurses manually pumped each iron lung until power returned. During that peak epidemic, Yvonne Hudson, a 25-year-old mother in Winnipeg, was hit by the virus. She had noticed a terrible headache followed by fever and trouble breathing. Also eight months pregnant, she was admitted to hospital and after five days was put in an iron lung. About 15 hours after entering the iron lung, she gave birth to a healthy baby, and she would spend six months in the iron lung. Stefania Olsen was stricken with polio at the age of 15 while living in the RM of St. Laurent in the 1940s, and she would require operations to replace the bones in her back, resulting in a handicap that she would carry for the rest of her life. In 1947, Kitty Walker of Carbon, Alberta contracted polio and had to learn how to walk again. As a result of this, she saw the need for occupational therapy and an outlet for products for the handicapped. Working with Speed Williams, who had lost both his legs, she helped form the Rehabilitation Association, which helped many people in the area over the years. That same year that Kitty Walker was stricken, Gordon Tully was out harvesting on the family farm in Manitoba when he was stricken ill. He was taken to hospital in Winnipeg and diagnosed with polio. His hopes for survival for the first few weeks were slim at best, but he would pull through and improve. Overall, he would spend 18 months in the hospital, and when he returned home, he still required a great deal of care and was confined to a wheelchair for the rest of his life. By 1948, polio was a significant enough problem that the federal government, thanks to Health Minister Paul Martin Sr., introduced an annual $30 million federal health grant program to assist public health work in Canada. This doubled the health budget of the federal government. In the fall of 1952, 
Dorothy Fox of Strathmore, Alberta, contracted polio, resulting in her spending the rest of her life in a wheelchair. Her sister, Gwendolyn, had contracted the disease a week before Dorothy, and she too would spend the rest of her life in a wheelchair. In 1953, Gordon Boyd had just returned home from his honeymoon when he was taken to the Calgary General Hospital and diagnosed with polio, putting him in an isolation for 15 days with 53 other polio patients. He would have to learn to walk again, and through the use of weights, springs, and exercises, he was able to return to normal by the early 1970s with his mobility. In the same year as Gordon Boyd, Edwin Flanders of Brandon, Manitoba was stricken with polio at the age of seven and went into a coma. He was sent to the King George Hospital in Winnipeg by ambulance with an RCMP escort and put into an iron lung, while having an emergency tracheotomy done. He was in a coma for seven days, and when he came out of it he was completely paralyzed from the neck down. And in 1956, after three years in hospital, the doctors said there was no more that they could do for him, and he was sent home with an iron lung that he had to sleep in for 12 hours a day. During the day, he came out and would sit in his wheelchair while wearing a corset to keep his spine from curving. At night, his hands and feet were put in casts to keep them from turning inwards. The iron lung was in the dining room, and his parents, Virgil and Isabella, slept on a Chesterfield. Eventually, his parents devoted their entire life to Edwin, only going where he could go in his wheelchair. Edwin eventually passed away in 1974. Even the elderly were stricken with polio. Harold McCausland of Riverside, Manitoba was a former pilot during the First World War, and he would be stricken with polio and confined to a wheelchair in 1950, which he remained in until his death in 1978. The move to develop a vaccine for polio was a strong one, with epidemics seeming to grow in severity in North America. In 1908, polio virus was first isolated, but it could only be cultivated in a living host, and the only susceptible non-human hosts were monkeys. In Connaught Labs at the University of Toronto, Raymond Parker, along with biochemist Joseph Morgan and Helen Morton, developed Medium-199 in the 1950s. This was developed while studying cancer cell nutrition, and it was the world's first purely synthetic nutrient medium for growing cells. Its purity allowed it to precisely measure the nutrient cancer cells required. In 1951, Joseph Morgan suggested to biochemist Arthur Franklin, who had recently joined the polio research team at the university, that they use the medium-199 to grow the polio virus in monkey kidney cells. This was done, and it worked perfectly, which allowed for the cultivation of the virus in a medium that was suitable for a human vaccine. Jonas Salk would request a supply of medium-199 to work on a vaccine. In 1952-53, Leon Farrell, also at the University of Toronto, devised the Toronto method that grew the polio virus in fluid cultures using large bottles rocked on a custom-built machine, allowing for large-scale production of a vaccine. A trial was implemented in this new form of the polio vaccine that would take place across the United States, as well as in Canada and Finland. The experiment would involve 1.8 million people, mostly children in grades 2 and 3. One-third would receive the vaccine, Another third would receive a placebo, and the remaining third were observed. This was called a triple-blind method in which none of the children or researchers knew who received the vaccine, placebo, or neither. Cannot produced 3,000 liters of the poliovirus fluids, shipping fluids to two pharmaceutical companies in the United States. In Canada, Cannot prepared the vaccine and monitored its Canadian introduction. On April 12, 1955, the results were released. The Salk vaccine was found to be 60 to 90% effective against the three types of polio virus. It was then licensed for use in Canada and the US. With the vaccine licensed, the American government and Canadian governments took different paths to getting it out. This is a very important announcement and a very important bit of news for the people of Canada, of the United States and of the world. And I know that we would all want to congratulate very sincerely Dr. Salk on this great discovery. At the same time, I should like to recognize the contribution made by Canadian scientists who at the University of Toronto's Connett Laboratories have done so much. Mm -hmm.
Toronto's Connaught Medical Research Laboratories shared headline news across Canada this week when research work at centers like this virtually ended the long reign of terror of poliomyelitis. Here, the poliovirus has grown to make vaccines. Kidneys of the rhesus monkey provide the essential food without which the virus, and therefore the anti-polio vaccine, could not be made. The kidneys are minced by hand, since mechanical chopping damages the tissue. Although minced to a fine pulp, the tissue cells are still alive. The living cells are placed in culture bottles with a compound called medium-199. Here, they keep on growing just as though they were still in the animal. After six days' incubation, the culture has nearly exhausted its food supply, so the exhausted medium must be siphoned out and replaced by 750 cc's of the new medium. Another few moments, and the innocent-looking liquid is seeded with one of the most fearful germs known to man. An exact measured two cubic centimeters of poliovirus must be seeded into the culture. Mouth control is the most accurate means. If she should accidentally swallow any of the virus, there's gamma globulin available in the next room. After four days of incubation, the virus will have fed and grown and multiplied 10,000 fold. With the second incubation over, the bulk will be set aside to lose its toxic power. The virus works this way. Even in its present inactivated state, it causes the blood system to fight it with substances called antibodies. The antibodies remain after inoculation, and the vaccinated blood, thus trained to deal with the real polio virus, makes the person immune. The identity test tells the technician which type of virus is contained in any bottle. One year ago, and these children in the southern United States were the pioneers for the now famous vaccine. After their third inoculation, they were given polio pioneer buttons, signifying that they too were helping to break down the barriers of uncertainty. One year ago, and the polio vaccine was a question mark. But now the waiting period is over, and parents all over the world are deeply thankful. The American commercial producers of the vaccine released the virus with little government control. In contrast, the Canadian government, as well as the provincial governments, shared the cost of the vaccine and distributed it free to children. On April 25, 1955, reports began to appear that some of the batches of the vaccine produced by Cutter Laboratories in California had not been properly activated. A total of 79 cases of polio were tied to the vaccine, and the U.S. Surgeon General recalled all of the Cutter vaccine, and a new polio surveillance system was set up. In total, 200 children were left paralyzed and 10 would die. On May 7, the United States suspended its vaccine program. This is where Canada comes in again. There was a great deal of debate about what to do. Prime Minister Louis Saint Laurent was resistant to allowing vaccines to continue, but his health minister, Paul Martin Sr., decided to continue with the program. Martin was a survivor of polio and had been blinded in one eye from it. Polio had also hit his son, future Prime Minister Paul Martin Jr., Martin chose to continue with the vaccination after getting advice from experts and seeing no cases of polio linked with the Connaught vaccine, which was the only one used in Canada. By not stopping the program, Canada was able to show that the vaccine was safe and effective, and due to this, the United States restarted its polio vaccine program in July of 1955. Now, nobody knew if it was a bad batch or if, in fact, there was a problem with the vaccine. Um, and so the Americans stepped in and stopped the vaccine. Right across the country? Right across the country. Um, what happened then, we had, we had already started, and therefore the pressure started to come. Canada, you've got to stop the vaccine. In fact, Mr. Saleron and my father were very close. Mr. Saleron thought we, could, we should not continue to extend the vaccine. My father um, spoke to the, all of the Canadian, the Canadian uh, scientists, spoke to Connick. My father was convinced that it had to have been a bad batch in the States. There was a lot of people who were convinced of that. And that my father said, no, we're continuing. The reason that he did that was, was twofold. Um, one, if he had stopped in Canada, 
that would have stopped the vaccine in North America. That would have, that would have, that would have tipped the balance. The second thing is my father was convinced it was good and having had polio, and I ta I've talked to him about this at length, he didn't want another child to miss getting the vaccine. He, he knew what it meant to have polio. Uh, and so he basically, my dad said, no, we're gonna continue. And it turned out to be the right decision. They continued to give it. Canadian kids got it. And in the States, as they saw what was happening in Canada, the States came back and started to give it. Paul Martin Jr. would speak about his memories of polio, which he had contracted at age 8 in 1945, saying, quote, What I remember growing up in southwestern Ontario was the polio was an annual affair that took place in the summer. Every kid was warned by his mother and father about it. You knew it was going to happen. That was a fact of life. It was also, by the way, probably what saved my life. Martin woke up one morning and felt strange, telling his mother he had a plate in his stomach. He was then on his way to a hospital in Windsor, where he would stay for a month and a half. He would say, quote, There was a fellow older than me in the war, in the bed just down from me, and they brought in an iron lung. Martin had polio in his lungs, and when he asked what the machine was, he was told that it was an iron lung, and that he was going to end up in it. Martin said later, quote, I've got to tell you, that's when I suddenly realized what I was in for. In March of 1956, a delegation from the Soviet Union arrived at Connaught to inspect the lab's polio vaccine production facility and to receive instruction on making the vaccine. At the time, the Soviet Union did not have a vaccine. By the middle of that year, Connaught was delivering 2.3 million doses of the polio vaccine, enough to vaccinate the 1.8 million children in Canada under the age of 10, 90% of whom received at least two doses before the summer began that year. It was recommended that three doses be administered for full protection. By 1957, Connaught Labs had a surplus supply of the vaccine, amounting to 1.3 million doses. At the time, it was decided there would be no exporting of the vaccine out of Canada, but since the vaccine had a limited shelf life, the government did eventually decide that exporting the vaccine could enhance foreign relations, especially within the British Commonwealth. In April 1957, the export ban was lifted and the polio vaccine out of Connaught was seen as a Canadian prestige item. By June of 1958, 5.5 million doses of the Connaught vaccine were shipped to the United Kingdom with an additional export to 44 other countries including Czechoslovakia. By the end of 1958, the Connaught lab had produced 17.3 million doses for exporting. The last polio epidemic in Canadian history would occur in 1959 when 2,000 were paralyzed. This outbreak was unexpected, but it had happened because the initial vaccinations had been provided primarily to the most vulnerable population segment, those aged 5 to 8. Those that were hit in the last polio epidemic in Canada were preschool children or adults who had not been immunized. By the end of that year, 45% of Canadians under the age of 45 had received all three doses of the vaccine. Vaccinate now against poliomyelitis. This is the advice given to all adults by the March of Dimes. Polio is no longer a children's disease. It strikes unprotected adults up to 50 years of age. When polio strikes the breadwinner or the mother, it affects the lives of the whole family, and recovery at best is a long, painful, and costly process. Why take such a risk when protection is as close as your telephone? Pick up the phone now and call your doctor. Make a definite appointment for your polio vaccination. Three inoculations give adequate protection. One now, one a month from now, and the third five to seven months later. It takes six to eight months to become fully protected. The vaccine itself is free. You pay only the doctor's fee for the office call. Take the advice given to you by the March of Dimes. Call your doctor now and be as safe as the children when polio strikes this year. Connaught Labs would begin to work with Albert Sabin in the late 1950s to develop a polio vaccine that could be taken orally rather than by needle. Since the SOG vaccine was already in heavy use across the country, a large-scale placebo-controlled field trial could not be done. As a result, the evaluation of the new oral vaccine was conducted through a genetic stability study in Quebec City and Montreal, followed by a larger field demonstration in Prince Albert and two small towns in Nova Scotia.
As a result of these Canadian demonstrations, the new oral vaccine was licensed for use in Canada in 1962. The Connaught oral vaccine had the advantage over the American oral vaccines because no export license was required in Canada, allowing Connaught to send its oral vaccine to countries desperate for production. This included sending 3 million doses to Japan. Since 1994, Canada has been considered polio-free. Roughly 31,000 people in Canada still live with the after-effects of polio from decades past. In 1988, there were 300,000 cases of polio in the world, but by 2020 that number had fallen to only a few dozen. Today, polio remains endemic in Pakistan and Afghanistan. The last known case of polio in the Western Hemisphere was a boy in Peru in 1991, while Europe has been polio-free since 2002. There is no cure for polio, but it is believed through the use of the polio vaccine, the disease could be eradicated in the near future. One of the most prominent organizations in the world for helping to eradicate polio is Rotary International. The organization is a Global Polio Eradication Initiative founding partner. Since their first project to vaccinate children in 1979, polio cases have fallen 99.9%. In all, Rotary members have contributed $2.1 billion and hundreds of thousands of volunteer hours to help 3 billion children in 122 countries. Their efforts have also pushed governments around the world to contribute $10 billion towards the efforts. And they also established World Polio Day, which commemorates the birth of Jonas Salk on October 24th. I hope you enjoyed that episode and my look at polio in Canada. If you did, please leave a rating and review. You can also visit my website where you'll find all my podcast episodes, as well as hundreds of articles on Canada's history. Just go to CanadaEHX.com. And again, you can support the podcast for as little as $3 a month. Just go to Patreon.com slash CanadaEHX, just like all of these wonderful patrons have. And I apologize if I mispronounce any names. Gary Dolovich, Nick Zinri, Pamela Elder, Shannon Marshall, Clinton Martinez, Dimitri Chauve, Aaron O'Hara Myers, Robert Dunseith, Todd Casey, Catherine Rawa, Luke S., Vic Hedges, J.P. Bear, Jason Hall, Phil Maynard, Spencer M., and Iris Gray. You can also find me on Facebook. Just go to facebook.com slash CanadianHistoryX. And I'm on Twitter. Just go to Craig Baird, C-R-A-I-G-B-A-I-R-D. I'm also on Instagram, and you just have to look for Bairdo37. Information comes from Canadian Public Health Association, the Canadian Encyclopedia, CBC, CBT News, Global News, the Museum of Healthcare, the Toronto Star, Health Heritage Research, Wikipedia, Cannot Fund, Heritage Manitoba, Meskenana, Its Story and Its People, Trail to Little Corner, Snake Valley, A History of Lake McGregor and Area, Old and New Furrows, Fraud, Area and History, Carbon, Our History, Our Heritage, Footsteps Through the Years, The Land Between the Lakes, Riverside Heritage, On the Slope of the Riding Mountains, and Millennium Memories. Thanks, we'll see you again next time.